Hey, welcome to part 3 of this series. In the last video, we proved a homeomorphism between the punctured sphere and R2 after finding an inverse to our stereographic projection function, and then proving continuity of both the forwards and inverse functions. In this video, we'll prove that the entire sphere and the one-point compactification of our plane are homeomorphic. Things can get a bit tricky when proving continuity at the north pole in the forwards direction, but it won't be anything too difficult. We'll also see that there's a nice theorem we can used to prove continuity in the inverse direction, including continuity at the point at infinity. Alright, so here are the functions we use to project between a punctured sphere and R2. This function f contains division by zero errors whenever the north pole is plugged in, so we naturally remove the north pole from the domain. But in this video, we're going to actually include the north pole in the domain. We are instead to think of f now as a piecewise function where the north pole is sent to the point at infinity. Likewise, we can rearrange function g as a piecewise function such that the point at infinity gets mapped to the north pole. I'm again redefining this function as g instead of f inverse because we haven't proven that g is f inverse. In part 2, we worked with the punctured sphere and its standard subspace topology. In this video, we'll be working with the entire sphere and its standard subspace topology. We form an element of this topology by intersecting an open subset of R3 with the sphere. This time, tau A includes all open neighborhoods of the North Pole. Because subspaces of topological spaces are themselves topological spaces, tau A is indeed a topology on our sphere. We previously equipped R2 with tau B, and we said tau B was equal to tau sub R2, which we defined as the standard topology on R2. This time, since we're working with an extended plane, we're going to need an extended topology. We'll say that tau b needs to include all the open neighborhoods of the point at infinity that are subsets of our extended plane. Before I define these neighborhoods, I need to tell you what it means for a set to be compact. Suppose that we're in some arbitrary topological space, x tau, and we have this compact set, which I'll call k. What makes k compact is that every open cover of k has a finite subcover. Suppose that these open subsets provide an arbitrary open cover of k. If we think of all these open sets as a collection of u sub i's, k being a subset of the union of all these open sets is what is meant by these open sets covering k. And this is where capital I is an arbitrarily sized indexing set. Since k is compact, this arbitrary open cover of k must have a finite subcover, meaning that we can choose a finite amount of these open sets that still cover k. So we can say that k is a subset of a union of u sub little j's, where big J is a finite indexing subset of big I. Now, if we're in Euclidean space Rn with standard topology, a subset of Rn is compact if and only if it's closed and bounded. This is the heine borel theorem. A set being closed just means that it contains all its limit points, and being bounded means that the size of the set is finite. Boundedness can be proven if a set fits inside of a ball. So now that we know what it means for a set to be compact, going back to our plane, suppose that k is a compact proper subset of R2, and that these open neighborhoods of the point at infinity are contained in a set fancy O of infinity. An element v of O of infinity is defined as the complement of k in R2 unified with singleton point at infinity. As k varies through all these compact subsets, we obtain all of the open neighborhoods of the point at infinity. Thus, to form tau b for this video, we can refer to fancy O of infinity as the set of all possible subsets v of our extended plane such that v equals the complement of a compact subset of R2 unified with singleton point at infinity. So this is the final definition of tau b for this video. This topology tau b comes from what is called the Alexandrov extension, and the Alexandrov extension topology on our plane is a topology. The Thus, our extended plane is a topological space. For other reasons, this Alexandrov extension is also a one-point compactification. I'll rearrange our topological space to extended Rn tau star because this concept generalizes to n dimensions. So there are three axioms of which need to be satisfied in order for a topology to be well-defined on a space. But since we're dealing with an extended topology equal to a union of two sets of open subsets, the closure under unions and closure under 
intersections axioms naturally split up into three cases for each axiom. Luckily, we already know that the standard topology is a topology, therefore we can easily get rid of the closure cases for the standard topology. Looking at the second union case, here in the plane we can take arbitrarily many elements of O of infinity and their union is some other element of O of infinity. For the third union case, if we have some element of the standard topology and some element of O of infinity, their union must be in tau star. Thus, tau star is closed under arbitrary unions. Likewise, for the second intersection case, if we take finitely many elements of fancy O of infinity and then intersect them all, this intersection must be in O of infinity. Lastly, for the third intersection case, some element of the standard topology intersected with some element of O of infinity must equal some element of tau star. Thus, tau star is closed under finite intersections. Okay, so we now know why our sphere and extended plane are topological spaces. Let's get on with bijectivity and bicontinuity. As a reminder, we already know that there exists a one-to-one -one correspondence between the punctured sphere and R2. So we can say that F is bijective when thought of as a map between the punctured sphere and R2. This can be proven with the help of knowing that functions are bijective if and only if they're invertible. Because of this bijection, there are only two additional points we need to worry about to prove F is bijective between the entire sphere and the extended plane. We only have to worry about the north pole and the point at infinity. By definition, f of n is the point at infinity and g of the point at infinity is n. By plugging the output of f into the input of g, we get g of f of n equals g of the point at infinity. And by plugging the output of g into the input of f, we get f of g of the point at infinity equals f of n. We can then substitute in n for g of the point at infinity and the point at infinity in for f of n. All right, we did it. This all implies that g truly is f inverse and f from s2 to the extended plane is a bijective function. Now that we've proven f is bijective, let's move on to continuity in the forwards direction. As a reminder, the topology on our sphere is tau a and the topology on our extended plane is tau b, where tau a is the standard subspace topology on our sphere and tau b is an extended topology on our extended plane. Tau b is a union of two sets of subsets, so there are technically two cases to prove continuity. We can say that our stereographic projection function f is continuous if and only if, for some v element of the standard topology on R2, the pre-image of v is in tau a, and for some v element of the neighborhoods of the point at infinity, the pre-image of this v is also in tau a. In our last video, we already showed that a v element of tau sub R2 has an open pre-image in the punctured sphere, and the punctured sphere's topology is a subset of the entire sphere's topology, so we're good on this first case. The second case is a bit trickier. We need to show that some arbitrary open subset of our plane that contains the point at infinity has a pre-image equal to an open subset of our sphere. This is how we'll prove continuity at the North Pole. Alright, so let's now begin with the proof that for some v element of O of infinity, the pre-image of v is an element of tau a. Okay, suppose that v is an element of O of infinity. This means that v equals the complement of some k in R2 unified with singleton point at infinity, and this is where k is compact and k is a proper subset of R2. We can then apply f inverse to both sides of this equation. Now, from set theory, it can be proven that functions distribute across unions. Therefore, we can split up our pre-image into f inverse the complement of k in R2 unified with f inverse singleton point at infinity. f inverse singleton point at infinity is the same as singleton f inverse the point at infinity. By definition, f inverse point at infinity is just the north pole n. Okay, let me clean things up. So, we know that f inverse maps r2 to the punctured sphere. Because of this, the inverse image of the complement of k in r2 must be a subset of the punctured sphere. The complement of k in r2 can be no larger than r2, so the inverse image of the complement of k must be completely contained in the punctured sphere. From here, if we unify both sides with singleton n on the right hand side, unification cancels out with set minus, and we're then left with f inverse of the complement of k in R2 union singleton n, all being a subset of S2. Look, here's the pre-image of v. 
and we've now shown that it's a subset of S2, but is it an open subset? That's the big question. We know that our function f inverse is bijective, and because of this, it's also injective and surjective. Now, from set theory, it's true that injective functions distribute into complements. What I mean by this is that f inverse, the complement of k in R2, turns into the complement of f inverse of k in f inverse of R2. We know that f inverse of R2 is the punctured two-sphere. Here, set minus singleton n cancels with union singleton n, and alas, we have the complement of f inverse of k in S2 as a subset of S2. Hooray, we have our final reduced pre-image. Now we just need to make sure that it's open. I'll now clear the screen. Okay, so we know that f inverse as a map from R2 to the punctured sphere is continuous, and it turns out that the continuous image of a compact set is compact. This means that f inverse of k is compact. K being a proper subset of R2 implies that the pre-image of K is a subset of the punctured sphere, which is a subset of R3. Ultimately, F inverse of K is a subset of R3. And from Heine Borel, we know that in Euclidean space Rn, compact sets are also closed and bounded. This means that F inverse of K is closed and bounded. What's most important is that F inverse of K is closed because a set is closed precisely if its complement is open. So this makes our pre-image an open subset set of S2 since it's the complement of a closed set. In other words, our pre-image is an element of tau A, and this implies that F is continuous. Awesome, we proved continuity at the North Pole. To give you a visual interpretation of what's happening, imagine that this purple subset is K. If we inversely project K, it wraps itself up to the sphere. The pre-image of V, which is the complement of F inverse of K in S2, must be an open neighborhood of the North Pole. Alright, now before we prove F inverse is continuous, let me first go over why our sphere is compact. We'll begin with this function mu that maps metric spaces precisely to the non-negative real numbers. It turns out that mu is a continuous function. We can think of our metric space as R3, x0 as the origin, and d as the Euclidean metric. Here's what this function looks like in this case. All of R3 maps to all of the non-negative real numbers. More importantly, if we restrict the domain to the standard 2 sphere, S2 gets mapped to singleton r, where r is the radius of the sphere. This singleton is a compact subset of a real line, and from Heine Borel we know that the singleton r is a closed and bounded set. For this function, s2 is the pre-image of a singleton, and it turns out that under a continuous function, the pre-image of a closed set is closed. This means that s2 is closed. We also know that it's bounded because it's of finite size, and we know that it's completely contained in r3. Once again, from Heine Borel, we can finally say that that S2 is compact. I'd also like to go over why our plane is a Hausdorff space. It turns out that all metric spaces are Hausdorff, and being Hausdorff is a topological property. This makes Rn endowed with its standard topology a Hausdorff space because the standard topology can be thought of as induced by the Euclidean metric. But what does being Hausdorff mean? Well, suppose we're in Euclidean space Rn, and we can assume standard topology. Rn is Hausdorff because for any two distinct elements, column x and y, in Rn, we can always find distinct neighborhoods u of x and v of y. Neighborhoods being distinct means that their intersection is the empty set. These neighborhoods don't have to be open, they just need to be distinct. But we can still prove a space is Hausdorff using open neighborhoods. The two open balls on screen might look like they're intersecting, but remember, they don't contain their boundary limit points. And this proof is commonly done with these open balls radii equaling half the distance between x and y. Alright, so it turns out that our extended plane is is also Hausdorff, and here you can assume the Alexandrov topology. For the extended plane, there are two cases to prove. It would need to be shown that distinct elements of Rn are contained in distinct neighborhoods, which is what I'm currently showing on screen, and more importantly, we need to be able to find distinct neighborhoods where one is a neighborhood of an arbitrary element of Rn, and the other is a neighborhood of the point at infinity. So if we take an open ball u of x in Rn, we can always take its closure Cl u of x, where this closure is the same set as the original ball u of x, except that it now contains all of its limit points. Since this closure is a closed and bounded subset of Rn, it's also compact from the Heine Borel theorem. The complement of this closure in the extended plane matches the definition of an open neighborhood of the point at infinity, and this open neighborhood of the point at infinity is distinct from the original open ball because both of the open neighborhoods don't contain the limit points at the dashed boundary. So this is why 
why our extended plane is Hausdorff. I'll now mention that a continuous bijection from a compact space to a Hausdorff space must be a homeomorphism. We know that our stereographic projection function f from s2 to the extended plane is continuous and bijective. We know that our two-sphere is compact and that the extended plane is Hausdorff. Therefore, alas, we can finally say that f is a homeomorphism. Hooray! Let me go over why this theorem is true. We'll start off with the closed subset c of s2. We know that s2 is compact and because closed subsets of compact spaces are themselves compact, this makes c a compact set. Let's now clear some text. Okay, we're assuming that f is a continuous function. Now, since the continuous image of a compact set is compact, the image f of c must be compact. You might be wondering, what if c is a neighborhood of the North Pole, and what if f of c is a neighborhood of the point at infinity? How could f of c possibly be compact if it shoots off to infinity? I thought compact sets have to be bounded. Remember, the heine borel theorem says that compact sets of Rn are closed and bounded. If f of c is a neighborhood of the point at infinity, it's not a subset of Rn because it contains the point at infinity. Hence, compact sets don't always have to be bounded. Alright, so we know that f of c is a subset of our extended plane, and our extended plane is Hausdorff. It also turns out that compact subsets of Hausdorff spaces are closed, which makes our compact set f of c closed. Alright, so we started off with a closed subset c and ended with a closed image f of c. This means that f maps closed subsets of s2 to closed subsets of the extended plane. This matches the definition of what it means for f inverse to be continuous. We've been using an open set definition of continuity throughout this series, but this is the closed set version, which still works. So that's why the theorem proves f inverse is continuous, and I'm going to end it here for the series.